A portion of this video was sponsored by Constant Contact. This is a 2014 BMW M6, and it is a fantastic modern performance car bargain. I say that because this car had a sticker price of over $120,000 when it was new, and it has 560 horsepower. Those are two massive figures, but now you can pick one of these up for around $45,000, which seems like a bargain. So today I'm going to review this M6, and find out if you should. This portion of my video was sponsored by Constant Contact, which is a very effective online marketing company that helps small businesses with online marketing tools, resources, and personalized coaching they need to help grow their business. Constant Contact offers a lot of benefits for businesses, including email marketing made easy with great expertise from over 20 years of experience. Constant Contact is an excellent partner in email and social media marketing with the resources and the knowledge to deliver results for your business. You can also use Constant Contact's Site Builder to create a personalized, professional, and mobile-friendly website for your business, complete with images and guidance on content in just minutes. And Constant Contact offers the tools to help you sell online with e-commerce. Whether you're just getting started or already selling online, Constant Contact can help deliver better results with expert retail marketing advice. So, check out Constant Contact and sign up for a free 60-day trial for email marketing by clicking the link in the description below. Thanks again to Constant Contact for sponsoring this portion of my video. Now back to my regular content. I've borrowed this M6 from a viewer here in San Diego, and I'm going to start with a little basics. This era of the 6 Series was by far the most beautiful 6 Series, far more attractive than the model it replaced, which had a powerful but very problematic V10. This uses a twin turbocharged V8 with 560 horsepower, 500 pound-feet of torque, big numbers, enough to send this car from 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. That's exotic car territory, and when these were new, they were priced like exotic cars. This had a sticker price of over $120,000 with options. These days, you can find M6 models from this era for $35,000 to $40,000, although they're a little bit more expensive if equipped with a manual transmission, which this one is. That's right, this is a 560 horsepower modern performance car with a manual transmission. That's something you can't get from Ferrari or Lamborghini or even Porsche, frankly. And here it is available for about the same price as a well-equipped Toyota Highlander. And today I'm going to review this M6 and find out if you should. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of this car and show you all of the quirks and features of this bargain high performance BMW. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features, the M6, with getting in. That means starting with the door, which is huge. This is a huge coupe. It has a huge door, and it really is a massive, heavy, large thing. So big, in fact, that they actually help you out with closing it. This car has soft closed doors, meaning if you just get the door sort of close into position, it will latch it for you automatically. Take another look at that. You don't have to slam the door. You can lightly close it, and the car will finish the closing job for you. A nice luxury touch. But anyway, then you get inside the N6, and the first thing you notice in here is the interior color, which is very distinctive. This is Sakir orange. Looks a little reddish orange to me, but it is a lot of color on the seats and on the door panels. Actually, I think it's a pretty good use of this color because they don't splash it everywhere and make it just totally overdone. Instead, it's just a little bit of orange to give you a little bit of extra performance car flair. Very distinctive, but not as distinctive as this, the gear lever. This is a manual transmission. Obviously, that's really no surprise. You know what this is. The cool thing is just how rare it is in this car. There are less than 70 M6 coupes with a manual transmission on the planet, and this is one of them. This came at the very tail end of BMW putting manuals in cars 
cars like this. Not too many people got it, but the original owner of this car did. Very rare to see a manual M6 today. And like I said, the manual cars tend to have a little bit of a price premium over the automatics because, well, this is just more fun and far rarer. But anyway, from there, we move on to the quirks and features of this interior. There are a surprising amount of quirks in here for a relatively modern BMW. One of them is the gear lever, which, when it's dark, actually lights up on the top. You can see the gear pattern is lit up, so even when it's dark outside, you know which gears to shift into and where they all are. A lot of BMW models with manual transmissions have this. I think it is a wonderful piece of attention to detail. And next up, another quirk in this interior. These are power seats, of course, but they have one powered item you don't see too often, and that would be the thigh support. You press this button on the side of the seat, and you can see the thigh support is extending to provide taller drivers with longer legs a little bit more support on their thighs if they're sitting with their feet on the pedals for a long time. It's nice to have. And of course, if you push the switch the other way, the thigh support goes back in, retracts back into the seat, so that shorter drivers can also be comfortable. Again, a nice piece of attention to detail. And next up, another unusual quirk in this interior. The center console has a storage area, of course, most cars do. This one has a little keyhole and you can lock it. That's not all that strange, except for the fact that you go over to the glove box and you can see no keyhole over here. For some reason, it is the center storage area that locks and not the glove box, like in basically every other car. It's flipped. Not really sure why they did that, although it might be because the center storage is actually larger. When you open up the glove box, you can see it's pretty small and there's a little box inside the glove box for smaller items, perhaps smaller gloves. Most people put like paperwork here and then the owner's manual in the other area since you have like two glove boxes of varying size. And next up, moving back to the center console, next to the gear lever, you can see you have three different buttons here with diagrams on them. On the top, you have like a tachometer needle or a speedometer, then you have a shock absorber, and then you have a steering wheel. Those control your various different settings. So the top one, the speedometer, controls your accelerator pedal and engine performance feature. The next one is your suspension settings, and the next one is your steering feel, and you can press those individually to adjust those individual components, which is a nice feature. Or you can just set these two buttons on your steering wheel, M1 and M2, to conform to whatever settings you like. So M1 is driver selectable. When you press that, it instantly switches to your engine, suspension, and steering settings that you've pre-configured. M2 is crazy. It is a no-holds-barred, pure sport everything in maximum mode with traction control off and in order to set it you have to press it once and then it asks for a confirmation and then you press it a second time and then everything is off and it's just you in the car and good luck. One other cool thing that happens when you go into M2 is the heads up display changes from this relatively docile normal looking heads up to this high performance heads up display that shows your tachometer and lets you know exactly when to shift so you don't have to look down at your RPMs when you're driving fast on the racetrack in M2 mode. And next up, another interesting quirk in here, back in the center console, aside from the gear lever, is the parking brake, which is this little switch. Now, most automakers go to an electronic parking brake so they can hide the switch somewhere out of place, and it doesn't take up a lot of space. But BMW decided to stick it right in the center, and it steals a lot of room in here. For instance, you only have one cup holder because there's not enough room for two cup holders because the parking brake switch is there, and the location of that switch also moves the infotainment controls over to the side of the center console area, and they're angled towards the passenger to fit in with BMW's interior design theme, all because the parking brake robs this valuable space. I'm not sure why they bothered using a switch instead of an old school parking brake if they were just going to take up all the space with the switch anyway. And by the way, speaking of interesting controls in here, I love the preset buttons in the center control stack. You can see one through eight. These look like radio presets, but they are not. You can preset them to do just about anything to go to various different screens or navigation destinations, which is a cool idea. But the coolest part is you can slide your finger over them to see what they're preset for. So if you forget, for instance, what you've assigned preset 876 to, you just slide over your finger and it will show you exactly what they're set for without actually having to press them. That is a pretty cool feature, like presets that give you a preview of what they do with a simple slide of your finger.
But while I love that control in this car, one I don't love is the turn signal situation. This car comes from the era of BMW's disastrous turn signals where you turn them on and then the signal stock returns back to center. So it's hard to figure out how to cancel it because you can't just push it down. That doesn't have any effect. So then you push it the other way and that turns on the other turn signal. And I find this to be one of the stupidest turn signal designs in history. I've complained about it in various BMW models from this era and apparently other people did too because BMW switched back to normal turn signals not too long after this. But you get one of these, you have to put up with that. That's probably why they've depreciated so much. And next up, still in that vicinity in the gauge cluster, they've done something cool. You can see with the car off, the gauges in the center just look like three quarters gauges that aren't finished at the bottom. But there's a little screen on the bottom and when you turn the car on, they've filled in the screen and it looks like the screen completes the gauges with some important information like your fuel level. I like that they did this. It is kind of a cool look. And of course, you can also use the screen to cycle through various different things, which interrupts the gauges for a moment, but then it goes back to looking like full circles. And that's kind of the benefit of the screen, some configurability. But in its default state, I like the full circle with the bottom half being the screen. Next up, another interesting control in this car is over on the driver's door panel, where you can see there's a whole blank area behind the window switches. I assume that's because this is the same switch panel they would use for cars with roll down back windows like the 5 Series, but this doesn't have it, and so it's just empty because it only has two windows to roll down. Kind of an obvious blank area there, but I'll let it slide. The other interesting thing there is the button below the window switches. That puts up or down the rear sunshade. Believe it or not, even though this is just a coupe, it has a rear sunshade, something you normally see in luxury sedans. In this car, it's part of the executive package, which got you some nice luxury features, and that sunshade was one of them. And next up, another notable quirk in this interior. On the dashboard, you have this speaker from Bang & Olufsen, intended to let you know you got a high quality sound system. The weird thing is when you turn the car on, the speaker actually rises up, but it looks like it tilts towards the windshield, which you wouldn't think would be acoustically beneficial. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's what it does. And when you turn the car off or the stereo off, the speaker goes back down so that it's flat again and isn't quite as obvious in its spot. Now, next up in this vicinity, you have the infotainment system. I've reviewed a lot of BMW models from this era. I'm not going to go through the whole infotainment, but I do want to highlight two rather interesting quirks. One is the speed limiter. You can set a speed limit so the car will beep at you and notify you if you've gone over a certain speed in case you are worried about going too fast on the highway you think you might not notice. The weird thing is this speed limiter allows you to select any speed between four miles an hour. That's the first one. So you can get notified every time you go over four which seems a little excessive. You can also set it all the way at 200 miles an hour. So the limiter could beep at you to let you know if you've broken 200. Hey, 200, you might want to slow it down a little bit. Seems a little unrealistic, both of those, but I appreciate the configurability. One other item in the infotainment system worth noting is the ability to record a note for yourself. So if you're driving along and you have some bout of wisdom, you can record it into the car and listen later. For instance, here's what I would record. Do not buy one of these new because you will get destroyed by depreciation. <laughs> The problem, though, I've noticed comes when you go to play back the note you've just recorded. I click on it, you can see play is not available. I'm pressing and it won't play. Instead, the only thing that is available to me is delete. That's my only option with this note. Maybe that's because the car knows what I said about it. But either way, in theory, you have the option to record a note and then listen to it later so you can hear your pearls of wisdom. And next up, it's time to climb into the back seat of the M6, which is pretty annoying on BMW from this era, not just because I'm tall, but because it's a two-step process that takes a while. To start, there's a little latch behind the driver's seat. You pull it up and then the seat back goes forward, but the seat doesn't actually move forward. Instead, there's a button on the side of the seat. You have to press it and hold and just wait for it to move forward instead of having it slide like basically every other seat. But once it is all the way forward, then you can climb in. And obviously it is tremendously tight back here. Very, very little room. You wouldn't really want to spend a lot of time back here or any time at all. And you pretty much have nothing back here to do except sit and wait until 
until you reach your destination. The windows don't go down, you don't have a cup holder, you don't have an ashtray, although you do have Bang & Olufsen speakers deck here to enhance your sound experience. But that is pretty much it. Otherwise, you're just kind of stuck back here with your head against the ceiling and your knees against the front seat. And next up we move on to the trunk in the M6. You can open it by pushing the trunk button on the key fob. Pops open and you can see the trunk is actually huge, absolutely massive, especially when you consider that the rear seat is so small. BMW clearly robbed rear seat space and gave it to the trunk, which actually was probably a good idea because they figured the old people who buy these big coupes will never actually use the back seat, but they will use the trunk to stick their golf clubs in. So you want to have a big trunk back seat doesn't really matter as long as it's there in case you need it for the occasional emergency once a year. And next up, let's talk lighting in this M6. Around back, nothing particularly unusual with these taillights, except that below the taillights, you have this weird reflector, which I've always felt was strange. It's like an eyebrow, except below but still kind of an odd placement. On the side, one thing I like is the side-mounted turn signals are integrated into this side gill that says M6. Instead of on the mirrors, like basically every other car, that is a cool look. And up front, I have always liked the look of the angel eyes in BMW models from this era. This one has them too. They still look good, very nice, very distinctive to BMW. Always a cool look that nobody else can steal and get away with it. More importantly though, I just like the look of this whole car. It was a tremendous clean design, and I really do think it was the nicest 6 Series ever. Yes, including the E24, the original 6 Series from the 80s. I just think this was a fantastically clean, beautiful design and a great departure from the weird 6 Series model that came right before this one. It looks great, handsome car, and it is aging very well. Nothing too excessive or weird that sticks it into a time period. It's just a nice looking car. But you paid a lot for that nice look. I have here the owner's manual pouch which contains the window sticker. Nice to see an M owner's manual pouch, not just the regular BMW one. They give you an M one when you spend this much on an M car. Of course, this also contains the owner's manual, and it's kind of weird, the front of this actually. It says the BMW M6 coupe, period. That's a full sentence. Then owner's manual, period. That's a full sentence. Then BMW M, period. <laughs> That's a full sentence. Very formal on the front cover of this owner's manual and frankly, questionable grammar. But you can also see in here the original window sticker. And like I mentioned, around $120,000 back when this car was new, actually 121, including options. This was a very, very expensive car at the time, but it's a lot cheaper now, which is one of its biggest benefits. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2014 BMW. BMW M6. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the 2014 M6. Now I've driven a few BMW M cars in this era, including with this powertrain, but I've never driven one with a manual transmission. I gotta tell you, it's, it's crazy to look at this interior and see all of the modern BMW switches and controls, pretty similar to what a new car has, and then a gear lever, it looks like it's been swapped. It almost looks like it can't possibly be real. But it is. Like I said though, less than 70 of these built. There were some cabriolets built, a few more, and then there were also Grand Coupes. There are M6 Grand Coupes out there with manual transmissions, which is a really special car in my opinion, because the Grand Coupe is a little bit more practical than this car, and I always felt a really nice looking sedan. But this is also a very special car, the M6 with a manual transmission. Unreal, it exists, and I'm really lucky that I found one to review. So how does it drive? Well, as you might expect, it feels pretty big. <laughs> It's ultimately a big coupe, and I think that was this car's problem, and it's why BMW canceled it, and it's why I was surprised when they brought back it as the 8 Series. It was like, didn't you learn there's not that much market for these big coupes? It's a sports car, but also a big luxury car, and it doesn't really fit, in my opinion, in the BMW ethos. As far as the shift action, because that's the weird thing here, uh, this car suffers from the same issue that I have with a lot of BMW models from this era in terms of their transmission, which is the clutch is just too springy. It's just not gradual enough it doesn't give you enough of a sense of comfort. It kind of wants to spring back and then it gives you uncomfortable starts, although it's pretty easy to master with shifts themselves. The gear lever though is great. Uh, these are my favorite gear levers, maybe up there with Porsche, I guess, from this era. They just feel, it feels great slotting it into gear and very notchy, which I like because you, you don't want vagueness in that area and it's very tight, uh, feels really good. As for performance, Wow. 
This car is fast. These are fast cars. That's the thing that I think is one of the coolest parts about this car. Um, you're getting, if you buy this car for 40,000, 45,000, maybe a little more if you can find a manual, which you won't, you're getting a fast, like modern car, fast feeling car. It really is fun and fast and enjoyable to drive. And I think that's just really, really a special thing about this car. It's not like you're paying a discounted rate and getting a discounted car in terms of performance. It drives fast. And there's more to it than just that too. You're also getting pretty good tech. I mean, this car doesn't have the very latest BMW technology, but it's only six years old and BMW stays on top of stuff. There are things in this car that you won't find in brand new cars still to this day, even nice ones. And so you got all of the stuff. You have lane keep assist, you have blind spot monitoring, you have ventilated seats, you know, different drive modes for the suspension, the steering wheel, not just sport, sport off. It's pretty impressive in this car what you get at the price point. And that to me is like its biggest benefit. And the fact that it has a manual transmission makes it even cooler because that just doesn't exist. You cannot find manual cars that have this level of performance and this level of technology anymore. They're pretty much gone. With that said, I mentioned earlier that it was big and it does. It feels like a big car. And driving it around corners, the steering is actually pretty good considering the car. It's relatively precise, but ultimately you do contend with a lot of car. It's a fairly large vehicle and it feels like a fairly large vehicle. And so going around corners and plodding along, you can't take corners as quickly as you could in, for example, an M4, which to me already feels like kind of a big car, but certainly compared to an M2. BMW does a relatively good job neutralizing this car's size, uh, making it fun to drive and sporty and feel fast but it's just hard to completely take away from the fact that it is a huge luxury car with a lot of features and you know leather and screens and all this stuff that contributes to its weight. And so that's the 2014 BMW M6. This is a very cool car and it's made even cooler by the six speed manual transmission. This is an ultra powerful, fast luxury performance coupe with a manual transmission that's something you can't get anymore at any price. So maybe you should pick up one of these. Although finding a manual is going to be challenging. Anyway, now it's time to give this M6 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the M6 is handsome, very nice, well-proportioned, though I'm not sure if it's quite beautiful, just very good. I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 16 under 4 seconds, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Handling is good, though ultimately this is a big car, and it feels it when you really push it, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Fun factor is good, especially given the power level and the manual transmission, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and this is pretty cool, but also quite under the radar. It wouldn't turn most heads or draw a crowd, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 30 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It's reasonably well equipped, especially for the time period, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is good, it's reasonably luxurious, although a little harsh, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is also good, though this engine isn't the most reliable, but it's fine, and interior materials are nice, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a car like this, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Finally, value, and I think these are great values. Underrated cars that deserve more interest, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 29 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 59 out of of 100, which places it here against a few somewhat relevant cars. The M6 is a good all-around car with a strong weekend and daily score, and it's a fun daily driver with good equipment and big power. And it's especially fun with a manual transmission. Ah!